I'm delighted to welcome everybody to today's uh, lecture um, in our annual lecture series on the history of medicine and ethics. We're so uh, honored to um, welcome uh, Baron H. Lerner, MD, PhD, Professor of Medicine and Public Health at NYU's Langone Health Program. Dr. Lerner is a clinician, bioethicist, speaker, historian, the author of five books, a regular contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Slate, and many other publications. Currently, he's the vice president of the American Association for the History of Medicine and is a member of the faculty at New York University's Grossman School of Medicine, where, in addition to his research and clinical work, he teaches medical ethics and also the history of medicine. Professor Lerner received his MD from Columbia in 1986 and his PhD in history from the University of Washington in 1996. Dr. Lerner is also a media commentator and speaker and discusses history, bioethics, and clinical medicine regularly on national public health radio programs, including Fresh Air, All Things Considered, Take Away, and All of It. Um, Dr. Lerner currently practices internal medicine and primary care at Bellevue Hospital Center in New York City. Uh, among his current books in print, uh, let me mention just three of them. One is called The Breast Cancer Wars, Hope, Fear, and the Pursuit of a Cure in 20th Century America. This book received the William Welch Medal of the American Association for the History of Medicine. A second book is called One for the Road, Drunk Driving Since 1900. So far as we know, this is the first history of drunk driving in America and was published by John, Johns Hopkins University Press. The third book that I'll mention is called The Good Doctor, A Father, A Son, and the Evolution of Medical Ethics. This tells the story of Dr. Baron Lerner and of his father, Dr. Philip Lerner, who practiced, of course, at different times, and examines each of their experiences with the evolution of clinical ethics and paternalism and patient autonomy, issues that profoundly influence health care. The title of today's talk is Fallen Medical Heroes, Should We Try to Catch Them? At the conclusion of the talk, we'll be eager to accept questions orally or posted on the Zoom chat. Um, Mindy Schwartz, uh, physician Mindy Schwartz working with us, will, will be directing the um, question and answer period. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Baron Lerner. Baron, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Siegler. Uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this lecture series. Um, I, I wanted to thank uh, Mindy Schwartz uh, for thinking of me when she was uh, setting up the, helping set up the group of lectures uh, and congratulate you, Dr. Siegler, and your center on your many years of unbelievably important work in bioethics. Uh, I vividly remember a visit I had to you folks out a while ago. I think it was before my famous patient's book came out or after. And it was an unbelievably great visit, very stimulating. And strangely, weird things you remember. I can totally remember the conference room we were sitting in around the table for some reason. Uh, but I remember it was an unbelievably stimulating discussion, and obviously the work of the center has been so vital for the history of bioethics. So very pleased to participate today. Thank you. Uh, so the good, I have good news and bad news. The good news is this is a brand new talk. The bad news is this is a brand new talk. So <laughs> uh, if you hear me give another one of my talks, it's very polished and has been done many, many times. You probably <laughs> like it, but- Politically, uh, I never. disagree with that. Yes, computers can You guys hear that. me okay? Yes, can everybody mute? Yes, I think that was a muting issue. Okay. So I was just saying that um, I 
I did practice the talk, don't worry, but I have no idea how long it really gonna be. So I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock and try to make it about 45 minutes so we have time for questions. Uh, and hopefully it raises some interesting and relevant issues. Um, and uh, Elena is gonna be advancing the slides because we had a little technical difficulty. So and we have not rehearsed that, but I'm sure it's gonna go fine. So uh, I'll just say next slide for uh, when we're going to go ahead. So let's do the next slide. Whoops, that's it. That's it. So um, I'm giving a little outline of the talk. So I'm, I'm going to start out, and this is, this is obviously, as you can tell from the title, is going to be a talk about both history and ethics. And I'm going to start out with a little discussion of uh, what we historians talk about as presentism. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this within the world of the history of medicine. And then I'm going to go through four cases of recent examples of uh, famous, renowned people in medical history whose lives and work have recently been questioned uh, because of other things they did during their careers. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to give some caveats and conclusions. So, but I just wanted to give you sort of a general direction of where I'm headed uh, today. Next slide. Okay, presentism. So this will be a concept known to uh, many of you, uh, but I'll give you one definition. Uh, the uncritical adherence to present day attitudes especially the tendency to interpret past events in terms of modern values and concepts. I think someone has to mute again. Because uh, the doctors here all suck. We did everything in California. Right? Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So presentism is a huge, I mean, I wrote here a huge no-no. Um, when, when I was a graduate student, in history, um, this was pounded into our heads. Well, what historians do is historicize. We look back in time and we try to understand what was going on in a specific era, what the issues were, what the questions were, and what choices were made. What was thoroughly criticized was presentism, another way, another term that people will use is being ahistorical. But taking our modern perspective, looking back, and suggesting that people should have behaved in the way we would expect them to behave now. So this is, again, a, a concept known to many of you. So that's what I'm going to be playing around with today. Now, um, the, the, as, as you know, I, I'm going to talk about four people in medicine, but this has been a topic very recently throughout society. Um, the current trend to judge the past due to current uh, issues. Um, uh, and historic, so, you know, and I'll mention this later, but things like uh, Confederate soldiers and removing of statues, we're going we're gonna to come to that. But medicine provides a pretty interesting case study of this, in part because so much of medical history has had to do with worshiping medical heroes. So now when we confront complicated issues about their past, we need to try to understand what to do about our current, our previous understandings of these historical figures and, and how we should understand them now. Um, I want to give a caveat. This talk uh, is not meant to exonerate or apologize uh, for historical figures who've done things wrong. I'm not going into the past and saying, everything's okay because this was a different time and place. I'm going to come back to that concept in a minute. I'm trying to get us to understand the historical context. I'm trying to do what historians do. Uh, and I, as I was told also in graduate school, history is messy. So I hope this is a messy talk, even though messy may not be such a good idea these days. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, um, and this is a little bit about what I was saying before. Um, uh, statue removing founding fathers. There's just uh, in the newspapers in New York just yesterday that they're removing a statue of Thomas Jefferson from City Hall in New York. It's been there like 
since 1845. Same type of issue, Just Jefferson a slaveholder, should this be there, should it not? Um, and, and as I suggested, it, it may be risky to historicize unless you do it carefully, but we're seeking in this talk to explain and not exonerate. Okay, why is history of medicine such a good place to start? Next slide. Because history of medicine has been dealing with this for a long time. Um, and it, a, a lot of this began uh, in the questioning of this in the 1970s. But what you need to understand first is the way history of medicine was written for many years. Most historians of medicine early on were not historians at all. They were amateur historians. They were often doctors um, who decided to write historical accounts of what happened in medicine. Uh, their careers and the people they knew and often their mentors. So medical history for hundreds of years was hagiographic. Um, there's a perfect example is a famous book about William Osler. I'm gonna talk about Osler later, written by Harvey Cushing, right? So Osler, the great uh, internist at Johns Hopkins, Cushing, one of his students, residents, later becomes a very famous doctor himself, writes this enormous biography of Osler. That's history. This is what Osler did. This is what Osler thought. This is what, where Osler was born. And almost always, this is why Osler was a great man and needs to be remembered. This was history. Um, but in the 1970s, a challenge was issued. And this was occurring throughout the medical, throughout the historical profession, what we call social history looking at historical figures, uh, what was also called great man history was being challenged throughout history and medicine was no different. Uh, a big problem with, of this was that all you learned about history was about famous doctors who were almost always white being written about by other doctors who were almost always white. So history was this very narrow, history of medicine was this very narrow area. Social historians come in. This is a very famous book for all of us in the world of history of medicine, um, uh, edited by Susan Reverby and David Rosner. I'll show a picture of Susan Reverby later because she's going to be giving a talk in this series. Um, next week. This, next week. Okay, next good. Week. This is product, product placement by me. Okay, so she's the best. Come to her talk. Um, so uh, this book challenged traditional great man history and said, we need to understand, to understand the real history of medicine, you need to look deeper than this. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't have a slide of this. So um, the challenge was, uh, who, what, what other ways can you understand this history? And it had to do with looking at other people besides white doctors. For one thing, white doctors were often at times racist, they were sexist, they were classist. We know this about, that's part of why the profession of medicine was so white and so male for so long. Um, also this work looked at what we might call the misdeeds of some of these doctors, things they did that actually weren't so good that might not appear in these hagiographic hey works. And um, what about nurses? What about other people who worked in hospitals and clinics. And what about patients? Almost invisible in all the works of medical history until Reverby and Rosner and their other social historian colleagues call the world of history of medicine to task. Um, now, this is a little bit different than what's going on now. It really, you know, to use a term that's not such a, even a good term necessarily, so much more canceling doctors, what we're gonna be talking about in this talk. That really wasn't the goal of early social history. Uh, the goal of early social history was to broaden how we understood history um, and to understand what else was going on and who else, what other voices were being stifled. Um, but this challenge is important because to some degree, history of medicine has been struggling with this issue ever since. Who are the who are the proper voices to be telling the story of history of medicine and how it should it, should it be told? Um, okay, so now I want to go to my four case studies one at a time. 
So next slide. Uh, okay, see, I did have another slide there. Sorry. Okay, this is when you don't advance your own sites. So let's just look at this. I, I've said most of this. Otherwise, I did think I had a slide. That's Susan Reverby with a very nice scarf. Um, and this is just some of what I said before, so you guys can read it. Other people were being pushed aside. Great doctor history obscured abuses in medicine. And these are the uh, other historical figures who are being uh, not seen. Next slide. Okay. So now we're going to come to our four, my four case studies. And I'm going to say roughly, whoops, my, I just lost my screen. One second. Um, so I have to put, put my uh, passcode back in. Sorry. Um, so we could talk about this during the question and answer because I think it's tricky, but I'm, I'm going to argue that my four case studies go from uh, most objectionable behaviors to somewhat less objectionable behaviors. And one of the challenges I think is drawing the line and that's never gonna be easy or definitive, but I think it's useful to try to make some distinctions about historical figures as we look back. So this story by this point is gonna be pretty well known to a lot of you, I think, but I think it's a useful one to talk about. J. Marion Sims, also known as the father of modern gynecology. And many of you know this story, how he did operations in the 1840s uh, to try to fix this very difficult uh, condition that afflicted certain women, vesicovaginal fistula, often occurring after childbirth, where basically there would be a pathway from uh, the bladder to the vagina, um, and women, unfortunately, as a result, would be incontinent of urine. Uh, so a very difficult situation for women, and doctors like Sims took an interest in it. Um, what Sims decided to do, he was in the South, he was from uh, Alabama, he decided to try out a procedure uh, to try to fix this. And it's a very long story, and again, many of you know it. Uh, but basically, he eventually discovered if you use a certain kind of silk suture and did an operation, you could close the fistula and cure these women. Um, this occurred in the 1840s. Who were his patients? They were, by and large, slaves. Uh, they were slaves who had this condition. Uh, they were slaves he obtained for his operations because uh, it was the South and these women had no uh, control over their own destiny or their own bodies. Uh, so they were Black women um, who were, underwent this operation. And we're going to talk about them in a moment. Uh, but let's talk about the heroism of Sims first. Um, he was lauded for doing this procedure, this curative procedure of this difficult condition, uh, and later moved to New York City, where he founded a women's hospital in New York City in 1855. Were there women's hospitals in New York City before that? Absolutely not. So Sims is seen as uh, someone who's doing good things for women. He has a whole institution uh, devoted to women's health issues. Uh, helps him get that title of father of modern gynecology. Uh, in the early 20th century, uh, one of many statues uh, of Sims is constructed. There's some in the South, there's some in New York City, because he's a famous doctor. And the one that uh, has gotten a lot of press uh, was not originally in Central Park, but was moved to Central Park in 1934, right across the way from the New York Academy of Medicine, for those of you who know New York and Fifth Avenue. So Sims, if you read medical history up until that era of social history that I told you about, was a hero. Uh, Father of modern gynecology, statues, did all these great things. Next slide. So let's talk about these experiments. This is, uh, again, the one, uh, this is a painting in the hagiographic hey era of the great Sims at the right with one of the slave women. We know three of their names, Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy. 
There were many others, we don't know their names. Um, this I think is believed by some to be uh, an image of Anarka. Um, and, you know, here's the great Dr. Sims about to do surgery on her. What, what, and the two other slave women in the back, probably about to get surgery also looking. So it's a very, I, I you know, we, you could talk about this photo, this image forever as a historical document. Um, but I, I show it because it's the one image that people tried to use from that era. Um, but what we know is it, it wasn't this peaceful by any means. Uh, and maybe what's going on behind the curtain there suggests that. Um, there was no anesthesia used in these surgeries. Um, you can only imagine um, what the pain must have been like to be having this type of surgery with no anesthesia. And in Narca, it is said, may have had as many as 30 operations. Um, words used to describe this, egregious, horrific, racist, I could go on and on and on. Um, these were slave women. Uh, the only reason Sims could do this is because they were black women, they were slaves, they had no power to say no. Um, and anesthesia existed by this time and Sims chose not to use it. And this is part of a long history of racism in medicine. Okay. Um, okay, so once this topic is starting to be discussed, people start to say, how can we continue to have this image of sins? How can we square somebody who was um, seen as a hero with these horrific stories that begin to get discussed again more in the 80s and 90s? And by the way, I was part of a group around 2000, 20 years ago, that's here's the statue that was in Central Park at the time about what to do about this statue. So that's when people in the neighborhood, to their credit in Harlem, started to say, we don't want this statue here anymore because this man was a racist and he did horrible things. We don't really care that others think he's the father of gynecology. We want this removed. Um, so um, you, this is where we start to encounter this great debate that we're gonna, I'll be talking about the rest of my talk. What do you do with a historical tribute to somebody like this? Is it ever okay to say times, uh, is, it, is it okay to say times changed and we are now in a different era and it needs to go? We need it out of here. It no longer deserves to be seen in a public space because what he did was so horrific? Or is what I just said presentist? And I'll take you back to my graduate school in history where people would be, um, you know, what, what do we need to say about this? Is this a proper historical assessment? So indeed in 2000, when this began to be discussed, one of the options that was discussed was putting some type of educational material by this sculpture and leaving it the same and saying, talking about Sims as a racist, as a, um, as a brutal surgeon who did these things and making it sort of a teachable moment and a plaque. Um, now, eventually that was decided not to be adequate and it was decided that it was too horrific and the statue has now been moved to Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, where is by Sims's gravesite. Next slide. Um, why was that decision made? The consensus was honor, and this is them taking down the statue a few years ago, honoring him was inappropriate. So we weren't erasing him by removing the statue, we were removing the honor of his place, of be, him having a statue and it being in a prominent place and it was a mistake in retrospect to have put up a statue to somebody like this in that place. And the reasoning again, just to underscore, whatever we were uh, lauding him for accomplishing was fully immersed in racism. He was, it was racism in thoughts and deeds and therefore any sort of honor to him was inappropriate. His victims were completely dehumanized. So to use my metaphor that I, called this talk, should people be caught? 
I don't think anybody thinks that Sims should be caught. Um, I think uh, that removing this statue and any honor to him was appropriate. Okay, next case study. Florence Nightingale. Okay, so, you know, I, this story is probably not as well known um, because it's gotten a lot of discussion recently, but not as publicly, I think, as the case with Sims. Okay, so a little bit about Florence Nightingale and her initial historical iteration, an iconic figure in the history of nursing. Um, the Lady with the Lamp, um, here's a, this is a typical painting of her. Um, what did Florence Nightingale do? She was a nurse during the Crimean War um, and went out to the areas where the battles were being fought and made or helped make a very important discovery. Assumptions were soldiers were, who were dying were dying from war. But what they were often dying from was disease or um, side effects of war, like infections and other things that happened because they were injured or just diseases. Um, armed with this information, Nightingale, the traditional story goes, was uh, a hero. She came up with many types of innovations to save the lives of these soldiers. Hygiene, wound care, food preparation, ventilation, you know, again, I, we can't go into all of this now. Many of you probably know some of this or have heard the version of this. Uh, and she's a hero as a result. Um, and this is interesting reason she's a hero. Um, one is she's a, a woman and a nurse, two, nurse and a woman. So I just got through telling you how too much of medical history was about white doctors. So when Medical history had the opportunity to actually honor a woman and a nurse. It was a natural inclination to do that because here we were actually not being so narrow-minded. And how about a nurse who figured this sort of stuff out before the doctors did and a woman who figured it out before the men did. So she was lauded. Um, and these concepts were to some degree revolutionary. Um, and there's actually a new book, uh, which I'll put a plug in for by a great historian named Jim Downs, who look at her as one of the first epidemiologists. Um, again, we could maybe talk about that in the question and answer, but I'd like to put in plugs. Okay. So a lot of impressive work done by her. Um, okay. And also she was criticized by male doctors at the time, because no one wanted a woman or a nurse telling doctors what to do. Um, that went on for a long time. Um, so again, she becomes a nursing hero and a feminist hero. Next slide. Um, but, and I'll put another plug in for a great blog, Nursing Clio. This is uh, one of many articles you can find there. This is particularly about uh, Nightingale, uh, called The Racist Lady with a Lamp by an excellent historian, Natalie Stake Doucette. Um, and I'll uh, summarize some of what she has come up with. Um, Nightingale, if you look at her actual writings, routinely used racist language. And she was what uh, critics have called a staunch supporter of British colonial violence. Um, there, there was nothing in her writings at all that was anything but supportive of colonialism and the uh, damage to colonial people and the disregard for colonial people that went along with empire building. And when, uh, when indigenous people pushed back uh, and, and people in colonies pushed back and were activists, um, uh, Nightingale was not a fan. She was critical of any actions that were uh, rejected colonialism and telling the British the, uh, what to do. Um, specifically about diseases, if you look at her writings, uh, there's no very little, even though she's very interested in helping indigenous people with their diseases through her hygiene, she blames them for their diseases. Uh, because they are lazy, they are unclean, things like that. They are more diseased. Um, so this is a very different view of Nightingale than the 
uh, than is being seen by the traditional history. Next slide. Okay, so um, if you look at people from this era, including activists, victim blaming is extraordinarily common. You'd be very hard pressed to find activists from the 19th century or early 20th century, who, and we're gonna talk about Margaret Sanger in a moment, um, who use language that doesn't blame victims. So even as activists try to help people, whether it's Nightingale or other activists, they are dismissive, they are critical, they're often racist, they are often classist. Uh, they are progressive in some ways, but not others. Okay, so um, this brings us back, back to the topic of this talk, which is historicizing. So what do we say about someone like Florence Nightingale, um, who was doing good things for people she didn't much like or respect? Can we use language that says, that looks back historically and says, let's look at Florence Nightingale in the context of her historical time. There were not a lot of people in Britain who were advocating for the rights of colonial people. Um, there were probably no one at her military hospitals who were doing so, but Nightingale did good things for them, even though her beliefs were, um, in retrospect, not very progressive. Is she somewhat less blameworthy? That is what you might posit if you're trying to historicize her. Okay, next slide. Okay, so perhaps you noticed how difficult it was for me to even say what I just said. And I, I was, I just had a, mo I had a mo moment which is sort of a little scary of somebody taking like two sentences of this lecture and posting them on YouTube, please do not, where you, it pretends like I'm agreeing with what I just said. I am I am not, but I'm just for uh, purposes of, of being, uh, understanding history, putting out that point of view. Because again, in some sense, senses, that's what historians do. They want you to look at the choices people made in their historical moment. So what about her choices and what about her historical moment? Okay. okay, so it's difficult and perilous to even raise this idea, but I'm gonna argue that good historians who contextualize and historicize never do so purely to exculpate. They do so to understand, okay? What were Florence Nightingale's choices? Um, what choices did she have and what choices did she make? And ultimately, while the era matters, the behaviors matter as well. The choices matter as well. She didn't have to make those choices. And indeed, there were plenty of people in society, maybe not around her, and by no means a majority of society, who were conceptualizing colonialism in different ways. Um, and a very nice quote from the article by Natalie that I mentioned before, which I think is very helpful, Excusing racism of any type of, excusing racism or any type of discrimination by claiming it is normal in a particular era is never okay. So I think that that argument wins the day. Next slide. Um, and free, um, again, we're not gonna be able to talk very much about Mary Seacole, but an important point that comes across in all my case studies is that when, when you look at white heroes only, you're excluding from the historical story often people of color who one might, who were very active in a historical sense and did important things, because, but because white people told all the stories about white people, these people uh, have often been invisible from a historical perspective. And as some of you may know, Mary Seacole was a, a, a woman from Jamaica, black woman from Jamaica, who was also a nurse in the, okay, I just lost my thing again, from the, um, uh, from Jamaica, who was also involved, one second, while I put this back in, 
who was also involved uh, during the Crimean War as a nurse and actually had a, uh, a, a dwelling where she took injured soldiers, who was also very progressive and very innovative as far as taking care of soldiers, uh, who was forgotten to history until very recently. So you, when you focus on one group, you exclude another. So important not to do. Let's go on to Margaret Sanger next. Next slide. Okay, this has gotten a lot of attention recently. I'm gonna argue that Sanger is even more complicated than certainly than Sims and probably Nightingale, uh, but people might challenge me on this. But I, I, again, I, I think I'm trying to follow progression here of degree of, uh, of behaviors. So Sanger, is, as most all of you undoubtedly know, was a, a legendary birth control advocate and feminist as well uh, in the early 20th century in New York City. She fought the Comstock laws passed in 1873 that made it illegal to transport birth control devices between states, which basically meant it illegal to distribute or sell birth control devices. Um, a very restrictive set of laws um, that uh, were it was basically in, in place across the country. Sanger, by dint of her being a nurse who worked initially on the Lower East Side in New York, got very upset about the fact that so many of the families that she was tending to, she was in a, you know, a, worked as out uh, in, in the field, was, had so many children, were so poor, didn't have enough food or resources, and the women kept getting pregnant over and over because they didn't have access or knowledge of birth control. To her, this was horrible. Uh, one quote, that you can find many of these quotes, I was resolved to do something to change the destiny of mothers whose miseries were as vast as the sky. Um, so what does Stanger do? She establishes clinics in poor neighborhoods in New York, first on the Lower East Side, but other places, including Harlem, that I'll mention in a moment, and sets up these clinics and starts to talk to these women about birth control. And the fact that they, there are items available that she's going to try to get them on the sly or out in the open to help them not continue to have children and to limit their size and to be able to care for their existing children and families. Um, the Sanger saw this as a huge financial and emotional burden for these women. Um, husbands, again, I'm stereotyping here, but to Sanger, the husbands were somewhere between indifferent and hostile to women saying they didn't want to have any more children. Um, and women were not empowered to take control of their own bodies and their own lives. So this is what Sanger did. She set up clinics. Sanger was arrested dozens of times because she, what she was doing was illegal, according to the Comstock laws. She was distributing birth, information about birth control and birth control items. Next slide. Um, okay. Um, I want to mention the issue of race because we're going to talk about Margaret Sanger as possibly a racist in a minute. Among the places she set up her a clinic was in Harlem. Um, Sanger didn't much care about um, where her clinics were and who they were serving, but that women were poor and women's families were too large and something needed to be done about it. Great biography of uh, Sanger, pretty old now by Alan Chesler. Um, and I, I use that, I put that slide of Sanger at the bottom. People are like, oh, this must be during uh, the influenza pandemic. Uh, bah, you're wrong. You're being pre presentist. Um, this is Sanger uh, wearing a mask because she felt her voice was being stifled when she tried to talk about birth control. So this was a... Uh, a uh, acting device by Sanger as part of her activism work. Every child a wanted child, that was her slogan. And uh, Sanger found what is now called Planned Parenthood in 1916. It was had a, obviously had a different name at the time. Uh, next slide. Okay. But Sanger turns out to be complicated when you take a deeper dive into her work. Um, 
this hagiographic view of her as a woman, as a feminist, as a the one of the first people that said women should take control of their bodies, the founder of Planned Parenthood, starts to be questioned. Um, this is one book. I actually haven't read this book, but I put it here. Uh, but there's many articles about this. Um, why was Sanger criticized? Okay, well, eugenics, which I don't have time to do a whole historical lesson on, and again, given this crowd, you guys know about it, but the belief in the early 20th century that many traits were genetic and passed from generation to generation um, was extremely strong at this time. Um, and I'll say more about that in a minute, but the idea uh, of eugenics was either positive or negative eugenics. Positive eugenics was that people with good genes, i.e. white people, white Anglo-Saxon people, should procreate more and create a better race. And people with bad genes should uh, procreate less um, was very much in the air, very common. And I'll talk about how powerful it was in a moment. That was the idea in that era. Um, and things like unfitness, terms like feeble-mindedness were seen to be genetic. So if you had a family that was unfit or feeble-minded, they would pass that on to the next generation. That was eugenics. Um, among the terms that Sanger used, as you see, was she was comfortable with saying that we needed to have elimination of the unfit she would call people who were poor and had bad genes human weeds. So you can imagine that you know, a metaphor of like pulling out the weeds or something. And here's a quote that's actually, if you guys want to see a pretty jarring YouTube video, I can give you the link. In this video, she says, the greatest sin is having children with disease from their parents and who have no chance to be a human being. Pretty jarring. Uh, and Recently, in the last couple of years, her, her name has been removed from the Planned Parenthood clinic she founded and an, the Margaret Sanger Award given out by Planned Parenthood. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is going to sound a little bit like Florence Nightingale, but let's push on this again. How could Margaret Sanger be so progressive in one way and not another? OK, now I'm going to argue that that, you know, even asking that question is a little presentist, but you can't not ask it because it's so interesting. Right. Um, and again, why historians try to get people to look historically is to realize why questions like that may be loaded questions. Speaking with, but it's a fair question. Here's someone who said women have no rights. Um, I'm empowering women but seemed blind when it came to the notion of empowering people who were perceived as unfit or feeble-minded and not saying derisive things about them, just the same way she didn't want people to say derisive things about poor women with big families, okay? Let's historicize a little bit carefully. Um, why was Sang did Sanger do this? Okay, well, as I said, you eugenics was mainstream and respected, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. The ideas that I just summarized briefly were uh, taught at major universities. Harvard and other universities had eugenics departments. You, you can, again, Google this, signs that say eugenics with university buildings. And this was being taught as the best science of the day. And there's a long list of famous historical figures, Teddy Roosevelt, Helen Keller, W.B. Du Bois, who were supportive to various degrees of eugenics. So why did Sanger embrace this? Next slide. She did this in what I would say when you look historically was very pragmatic. Sanger had a, was a zealot. She had one thought in mind. I want more birth control out there. I want women to know they can uh, have fewer children. I want women who are poor, women who have diseases to have fewer children. I want them to think they have the option to have fewer children. Well, who was saying this in society then? 
Well, two groups, the birth control people, but they were all getting arrested if you spoke up too long. And it was the sort of thing you couldn't talk about in public company. Sanger was trying, but it was shameful almost to talk about birth control. So Sanger looked to another group in society was saying similar things to she was, albeit in a different way and coming at it from a different historical and scientific perspective. She said the eugenicists have similar thing concerns as I do. They're interested in people who come from poor families and don't have enough money and maybe aren't that educated in having fewer children. So I'm not uncomfortable with those ideas. So you can see her with these quotes that I mentioned before, not uncommon in her writings and on TV. But I'm gonna argue that she in her heart of hearts was less a eugenicist than a pragmatist. And that's an interesting historical finding because I think it happens all the time if you look at the history of activists and we could talk about other examples. And again, this does not excuse but helps explain. Okay, let's go to Osler and I, he's our last one and then I'll, we'll finish in about five, 10 minutes. Okay, Osler's the, the latest entrant to this group of famous historical figures in medicine who was famously venerated um, and now I was getting questioned. Okay, again, super duper fast. One of the four founders of Johns Hopkins Medical School, unbelievable innovator in medical education, put medical students on the wards, a great humanist. Most doctors, even well-read doctors from that era don't write like Osler. Osler as a gift for understanding medicine as a, so almost as a social process. I'm a doctor, but I take care of patients. They are people, technology, I'm not a technician. I'm a person who sees patients and not disease. Again, that's a ter terribly brief uh, description of Osler. Um, but he's beloved because of that. And with, with great understanding, if you read Osler's writings, next slide. Um, here's a, bio, I mentioned earlier biography in Osler, here's another one, 1999, Michael Bliss. Some of you have probably read it. Bliss, a great historian. He, he makes fun of this concept in the beginning of his book. He's like, I went to write a biography of Osler and I know it's bad by 1999 to write hagiographic hey, things. It's looked down upon in medicine. So I'm going hunting for things that Osler may have done that need to be questioned. And he has this quote in the beginning of his book, try as I might, I could not find a cause to justify the death of Osler's reputation. So he's like, this guy was just uh, wonderful and deserves to be lauded. Okay, next slide. But we might argue that Bliss didn't look hard enough or as this isn't original with me, that maybe he looked and saw something that other people would have seen differently a topic we could get into if we want to. What's the problem that people writing about recently have with Osler? Uh, he tolerated racial segregation on the wards. Johns Hopkins was a fully segregated institution. And the black patients at Johns Hopkins got worse care than the white patients at Johns Hopkins. Didn't seem to bother Osler, famous, important doctor, didn't do anything about it. Osler, here we are with eugenics again. Osler was the vice president of an international eugenics conference in 1912. He didn't speak at the conference about eugenics, but he's on the program talking about medicine and he's listed as a vice president. Um, there are several, but not too many quotes by Osler in which he seems to favor white supremacy when he's asked in various contexts. Here's one of them. We are bound to make our country a white man's country. That had to do with Canada. Um, Osler was Canadian, okay? Um, so you start to see if you pluck and you dig things that Osler said that Bliss seemed to miss or ignore that call into question this legacy and makes you wonder, well, was Osler a racist? Like we think Sanger was and Stim certainly was and Nightingale was. Next slide. And here's a, again, an article uh, actually, the original article came out of the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Glad to give people the um, 
Wink, and this is an article written to the Montreal Gazette after that article came out that's by a doctor. Uh, I'm logging myself back in again. I just don't know how to um, not have this happen. Um, written by a doctor uh, in Montreal, a pediatrician, uh, where Osler is beloved at McGill, where it's the Osler Library, and she just savages him. Look at that. Celebrated physician played a part in creating a medical culture that has dehumanized individuals and stigmatized entire communities. That's the opposite of what Bliss found. Okay, so he is being actively, actively questioned. Next slide. But there's been a pushback here. Um, there's a group called the American Osler Society that some of you know about that has been active for decades, praising Osler, that sort of does a more traditional history of medicine. There's been an energetic rebuttal saying, come on already. I'm, just, I'm using, putting myself in their voice. These critics, you plucked out like a quote here and a appearance at a conference here. Where's, look at the bulk of this man's pronouncements and accomplishments. He didn't write about eugenics. He didn't, there's a couple of quotes. He's, they're taken out of context. And now you're canceling Osler. Um, this has to stop. Um, and maybe using the metaphor of this talk, maybe Osler should be caught. Okay, so I have a couple of summary slides. I know I'm going a little late. Okay, so one caveat. Maybe I put this here partly because I some of the audience might have raised this and I did want to raise a very important issue. Should I be even giving this talk? Maybe there's more important things we should be talking about. Am I doing the same thing that others have been accused of, which is, although I'm being pointing out criticism of famous white historical figures, maybe I'm giving them too much attention again. What about forgotten minority doctors and nurses or other people in medicine actively excluded by these heroes, rejected by these heroes? Uh, evidently, Florence Nightingale was critical of Mary Seacole and tried to downplay Mary Seacole's accomplishments. Shouldn't we just be talking about Mary Seacole and are we just talking about white uh, people again? I would argue this is a valuable uh, lecture, but I'm also thrilled at the crucial scholarship that is looking at the actual historical record of minority people uh, who worked in history of medicine. Next slide. Okay, so let's get some concluding things. What do I really think here? Again, three... One book coming out on the left that's going to be great, and two classic books on medicine and race that are, I just can't say enough about, Rana and Deirdre's books. Um, some conclusions. Let's take criticism of white male historical figures in medicine seriously. We're at a very important historical moment. There's a reason that we're questioning the traditional historical scholarship Activism like Black Lives Matter and Me Too are active in this country now. So it's not surprising that we're revisiting traditional historical stories in new ways. I'm not saying that these people writing these works are just looking from our modern perspective and looking back and looking at history from our modern perspective. They're not, they're historicizing. That's why these books are so good. So it's okay to take criticism of historical figures uh, as meaningful and important and, and enjoy this new scholarship. Next slide. Another reason this is important, it matters to our students. Uh, this is the medical school class. Um, I will put on the record that uh, I run the ethics curriculum at NYU for medical students and recently, yes, Peggy, Harriet Washington's book too. I'm, I'm not going to chat. Yet. Of course, medical apartheid. Thank you. Um, that medical students um, in my institution have been critical of some of our lectures and some of our small groups, and have given us pretty uh, intense feedback. I welcome it. These students care deeply about the history of medicine and the racist aspects of medicine. They're not wholly critical of medicine but they're asking those of us who do work in this field to be critical and to 
look at new perspectives that haven't perhaps been taught in medical school. Are these students always right? I don't think so. I think sometimes things get exaggerated and people are saying things that aren't so bad, but this is a great opportunity for medicine to examine its past. Next slide, two more slides. And I'll be a little more provocative here. I don't have the answer to this, but what is all of this new questioning of the history of medicine and historical figures say about what I learned in graduate school in history? Presentism was the worst thing in the world. Well, okay, let's historicize that. The people who said presentism is a careful point here. People who are criticizing presentism, you know, when I was in graduate school or, or, or we're doing it now, are them selves historical figures. So they are choosing to criticize presentism as historical figures. It doesn't mean they are necessarily right because they're saying it. They believe they're right and they believe presentism is bad and leads to bad history. But presentism itself deserves to be historicized. And you could ask another provocative question, is applying modern understandings and language to historical figures and events always wrong? Now, this is is but potential slippery slope and people I, I imagine that in the comments will have lots of points if you understand the point I'm making. Um, but it's a question that needs to be asked because certainly people doing work now in the field are less uncomfortable applying things we know now, not bad history, but applying things we've learned and terms we use now in a historical context. Last slide. Okay, and what about practically? Um, should we save these figures I'm talking about? Well, as I think I've suggested, some behaviors and beliefs are irreparably terrible. Uh, Sims being an example. I, I, you know, there's some who argue his statue shouldn't even be in the cemetery; it should just not be anymore, and that's a pretty reasonable argument. Um, I strongly support, in general, removing or eliminating honors for people who made bad historical choices when there were other options. People like Margaret Sanger, I have, I support, I have no problem with Sanger's name being removed from um, the clinic and the award. It, it's too uh, inappropriate to give someone an award with a name that is associated with some of those quotes that I read. Now, you hope that Planned Parenthood and other organizations continue to talk about Margaret Sanger and do it in a good historical way, but awards, not so much. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to be careful of isolated statements that may be unrepresentative. Here I'm getting closer to Osler. Um, you know, you could find, if you look hard enough, and if everything we ever emailed and any historical figure ever wrote or emailed could be obtained and gone through, you're probably going to find stuff that I'd be like somewhere between head scratching and like, ugh. It, it, you know, I, I don't think it's helpful to merely be doing that as sort of a gotcha sort of thing. So I think we need to be careful and we need to be careful where we draw the lines and remember that none of us, whether us in person now or historical figures, is ever perfect. So I will stop there and I think we have some time for a chat. So hope that wasn't too discombobulated and sorry for the technical challenges. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank you. Mindy, are, are you there? Oh, I'm absolutely there. Thank you, Baron. I knew you would give a uh, provocative lecture and you identified four people who I think are really emblematic. Now, I would love to have this conversation continue and want to hear what people say, but one of the interesting things about some of the people that you mentioned was that the backstory as a clinician is very compelling, and that's why I was so excited for you to, to speak, because in of historians, those people um, like Barron and people who live in a clinical world understand the back and forth and the specifics, and one of the things about Margaret Sanger is her mother was Catholic and was pregnant 18 times because you know, I had multiple kids and died very young. On the other hand, it's always challenging to me to, you know, to uh, vindicate, not vindicate, but um, criticize people 
who lived in a time before things that we now take for granted, you know? I mean, I was listening to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and you can't even listen to them with modern ears because it's so painful and it's so antiquated, you know what I mean? And that was, that was a political debate, so I think that this is a great topic, and I think it really uh, only opens a lot of Pandora's box. So I'll just say, um, oh, you know what, I'm going to, I want other people to speak, so I'll come back to those thoughts. Should I call people who's going to, Elena, do you want to do it? I, I got Peggy and I steal. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Peggy. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. I, I have um, two, two questions. The first is just on the eugenics bit. You know, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that Helen Keller was, uh, spoken in favor of eugenics from a particular vantage point. Um, what difference does that make when it is somebody such as Helen Keller? And what difference does it make related to that? What difference does it make that you could one could argue that today we practice a different version of eugenics um, through prenatal testing and through uh, the exercise of, of passive euthanasia um, treatments of neonates such as anencephalic children. Um, and then the second question is, when you, what, what about, it, it? you made me think about Moniz and Walter Freeman. So this is the leucotomy lobotomy. And, you know, what was, what was sort of interesting about them is that they had really good motivations and then arguably particularly freeman took it off the rails um and and a, a person who to compare them to is cooney who used to exhibit preemies um in the world's fair because it was the only way that he could treat them and he was beloved by his uh, the parents of the babies that he treated, um, and yet the instant reaction that people have today to his actions is horror that he would exhibit these children. If you actually read about what he did, you could make an argument that he was far, far humane than the physicians were at, at, at the time. So anyway, those are poorly formulated questions. I just thought I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, let me say a little bit. I mean, there, I, we could talk about each one of those like for hours. It's so interesting. But, you know, I guess the way I would try to um, understand those things is to get, again, get people to try to think historically. So Helen Keller, you know, again, I, I, there's a, to, to plug another interesting historian, Aya Nuridin uh, is, a, is a historian who's written about beliefs about eugenics among black populations in the 20s and 30s. And there you say, wait a minute, how could black people have supported eugenics? Well, that's what you, that's, you go read it. How could Helen Keller have supported eugenics? She was, she was blind and deaf. She was feeble-minded according to eugenics. How, okay, so you go back and you understand how people can have different thoughts in a different era, can have different, keep different, seemingly contradictory from our modern perspective, different thoughts in their minds. What choices did people make? And I think that's a good lesson for if we're looking at modern issues with, for example, prenatal testing. Okay, well, so that's a fair question. And, you know, I think if you look historically and you say there's a history of eugenics, um, how does our, how did people make their choices then? What bad choices were made? What good choices were made? And to people who are doing prenatal testing now, bring that knowledge to, to modern prenatal testing and even discuss it. Um, and obviously consent helps these days, which there wasn't any then. And, you know, using our knowledge of history to help explain why we're still doing these tests, the way they can stigmatize and try to get people who are being tested to understand this as best as possible. Um, and what was it before the preemies you said, who was the person you said before Cooney? 
Yeah, Moniz, Moniz and Freeman. And Moniz, yeah, lobotomy. So again, a great, another great example. Lobotomy won the Nobel Prize. How could they have been so stupid to give lobotomy the Nobel Prize? Well, Jack Pressman has a wonderful book on the, that historicizes lobotomy, the best science of the day, okay? Freeman made bad historical choices. Freeman was a showman. Freeman was interested in publicity and Freeman didn't have patients' best wishes, uh, best interests at heart. So Freeman made bad choices. He's a historical figure that deserves to be criticized. But if you look at lobotomy more broadly, it was a scientific attempt to understand a, at that point incurable disease. Um, so that's why history is so important. Uh, Asil? Yeah, thank you for this great talk. Um, listening to the example of uh, Florence Nightingale, I was just um, disturbed because there was um, there is a Disney cartoon production uh, called Dr. McStuffings, and the whole idea of it is trying to promote an African American um, little girl that she's a great doctor. She treats her stuffed animals, uh, taken after the example of her mom, who's a doctor. And in one of the episodes that I watched with my children, they are glorifying Florence Nightingale. So my question is. Um, if this is part of history, do historians uh, and experts such as yourself um, feel morally um, obligated to reach out to any um, uh, production to basically correct um, uh, the information that they're trying to put out there, especially when this is just targeting young children? Uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say correct because, you know, I, I think we, I think, you know, as a historian, looking back at this, you have to be, know your audience and be careful. Um, I, you know, I mean, Disney, you know, it's, it's I, I mean, they're doing something good there, it sounds like, if they're trying to empower young black girls to see what they can achieve. Um, but, but, you know, a, a well-placed email to the people who made the film and say, hey, there were great, um, great things that went on in this film, but... There's some new scholarship on Florence Nightingale um, that you might want to know about. And here's a copy of this article. And, you know, maybe if you are ever thinking about redoing this film or putting a caveat in part of the film, uh, you might want to consider doing that because uh, Florence Nightingale, while lionized, is not unproblematic. So it's probably not a bad idea. Jay? Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for this talk. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm a uh, I'm a philosopher uh, by trade. Uh, so and we are uh, currently undergoing this whole conversation in, in my field of you know where you know giants in our giants in our in you know in the history of philosophy, Immanuel Kant, David Hume are all sort of undergoing very similar kinds of uh, discussions. And so one, uh, two sort of two sort of thoughts. One one possibility here is uh, drawing from some something that happens in say constitutional law. We think about like severability, where you know, to what degree can we can we sort of okay, this person has objectionable views about about um, about race, about about sex and gender. Um, to what degree do we can can we sort of can we sort of separate? Can we sort of, you know, separate the that sort of those those uh, those problem views from their sort of what we take to be their sort of central insights? Um, you know, so for example, does you know say like Immanuel Kant's views about uh, views about gender say actually in actually start to infect some other parts of uh, of his of his uh, of his contributions? A second thought, though, is that you know there, I think there's something important about you know, teaching, uh, I, I think there's perhaps something of a uh, kind of intellectual humility that is, I think, important in, in presenting, in presenting, you know, these past figures as, like, as, as, co as complicated that we look back on and judge, you know, perhaps quite harshly to sort of extend to our, to our medical students that, you know, 
just as these people, as brilliant as they are, as, as moral as they were in many ways, are capable of making egregious, egregious errors. Um, so you, uh, you know, you are capable of that as well, and you should be very mindful of that. So, so yeah, so the severability possibility, and also like how sort of this can actually used to uh, encourage some intellectual humility in med students. Yeah, I mean, those two points go very well together because, um, you know, on the on the one hand, um, the separability issue, you know, one answer to that is um, what we think now is you can't separate them, right? What the activists say now, separating them is wrong. Um, and I guess personally, I agree with that mostly, but but it's a historical choice as well. Um, people who are writing about this, who are active in the field of history of medicine and, and other philosophy now uh, are arguing this, that it's not okay to still say Margaret Sanger was cool and let's just put the other stuff to the side. Um, but that's a, in, in 50 years, is it possible that people are going to be like, no, it's okay to, to separate? Maybe. And those people who are not separating them were narrow-minded and wrong. I guess it's possible. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen because I think we're progressing in a way that is looking at historical figures in a very sophisticated way. Um, but but it's important, I think, to, to, to keep that idea out there, which segues into your second point about medical students, that absolutely all students... Yes, humility, um, what, what you believe now, what you're learning now, uh, people in 50 years are gonna look back at this. I don't know what it's gonna be, um, but they're gonna look back at things and be like, what were they thinking? Um, and it could be things that you feel very passionately about now because there's gonna be more knowledge and it's gonna be a different historical era. So I, 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 that's a great point. And I, I underscore that with, with medical students all the time. And, and, and also, uh, and these are not original ideas to me, but, but people starting to write about this and trying to put that idea in the head of people give various examples. So one that, that, that you've probably heard and the people are using is this. Okay, 50 years from now, um, people will be saying, I don't know, 50 years, that's just a made up number. How did everybody have cell phones when they darn well knew that they were being manufactured in China, and I'm getting this not exactly right, by uh, people who were being oppressed, who weren't making any money, and that's how everybody got their cell phones and they willingly use cell phones. Those people were terrible even if they were great people, even if they were climate change activists, but if they were doing this on their phones, the heck with their climate change activism, they were oppressors by doing that. Okay, this is like a, I don't know, but it's, it's one way to get students to engage that something they're sitting, they're potentially criticizing historical figures and they're doing it for good reasons and they might think they're right, but something sitting on their desk could be criticized in years to come. So it's a very, and you got, you got to make that argument very carefully but it's very interesting. Um, do we have time for more, Jake? I think we have to finish by 2.30. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I uh, briefly wanted to touch on one question that you brought up at the end of your uh, lecture here about um, should we be having this discussion or not, which uh, quickly, I think we should. I think it's a, a important discussion, um, but you raised something uh, during that discussion um, that I thought of when, and you mentioned this book, um, this is the, the new uh, Jim Downs book, Maladies of Empire, which I highly recommend, um, how colonialism, slavery, and war transformed medicine. He talks a lot about erasure, how these groups have been written out of the history of medicine. And um, I just want to say that I think this is a, a great talk, but I think that as you did when you touched on Mary Siegel, this is a great opportunity to shed light on some of those voices that have been erased. And so I'm curious if like Mary Siegel, there are other individuals or groups um, that could be brought in as examples of this other side of the coin that have been left out of the narrative that could be included as you said, you know, this is a new lecture, right? Um, as you kind of work on this and put it together, 
is there a way that we could try to be more inclusive and shine a light on some of these groups that have been left out of that discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, it would, it would be sort of a longer talk. And <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the, certainly the books that I flashed there very quickly by uh, Rana and Deirdre and then Harriet Washington. And, you know, so there's lots of very good history that has been written and is being written that's sort of resurrecting historical figures. Um, and, you know, I think that's probably a good idea for another iteration of this talk is to actually include a little bit more and maybe try to give some examples of that history to make it more. Mine was sort of a theoretical, I, I don't mean to say others are doing this work and I'm glad I don't have, you know, that I, I can focus on this, but it might be a nice way to um, actually demonstrate just what types of accomplishments in history was being has been forgotten. I guess that's what you're saying. Although I'm also looking at your, your historical figures on your wall about each other, trying to see what's up there. Okay. Um, all right. Dr. Lerner, I, I'm, I just, I, I, I can't stop without telling you that I was born at Women's Hospital um, on 109th Street on the west side of the city in sort of the south part of Harlem um, in 1941. And that hospital, I, I had no idea it was founded by Marion Sims uh, in 1855, as you told us. Um, it was closed in 1964 when it was taken over by St. Luke's and Roseville and integrated into St. Luke's and Roseville. So it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but, but that it was the first women's hospital in New York City. Was it among the first in the country? Too? I think in the country. The country, yeah. extraordinary. Um, my, my mom and father uh, thought the world of it, yeah. And, uh, but uh, th thank you for extraordinary talk.